Welcome, everyone. Glad everyone could come. Representative Jason Chaffetz is the United States Representative for Utah's 3rd Congressional District, based in Provo. Uh, a Republican, Representative Chaffetz was born here in the Bay Area and began his congressional career in 2009, following several years in the private sector. He serves on a number of committees, perhaps most relevant to us today <coughs> and to today's event, is the House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Intellectual Property, Competition, and the Internet. It was actually there this past winter that Representative Chaffetz played a key role in defeating the Stop Online Privacy Act, or SOPA, which, as the Congressman said at the time, would have given IP owners unprecedented power to effectively pull the plug on websites that merely accused sorry, that they merely accused of copyright infringement without the protections of the judicial process. He stated that SOPA would harm the internet and American innovation and called for actual technical experts, or in his words, the nerds, to be included in hearings on the bill. Those balanced hearings, of course, never came to pass because following the grassroots boycott, SOPA died. Representative Chaffetz is currently the House co-sponsor on the Geolocation Privacy and Surveillance Act, which clears up uncertainties following the Supreme Court's recent U.S. versus Jones decision by giving government agencies, commercial entities, and private citizens clear guidance for when and how geolocation information can be accessed and used, including requiring law enforcement to get a warrant before using geolocation information to track people's movement. Representative Chase Pitts is a busy man. In addition to Geo the Geolocation and Privacy Surveillance Act, he's co-sponsoring the Fairness for High-Skilled Immigrants Act of 2011, which is actually already passed the House, but is still awaiting committee referral in the Senate. The bill would end per country caps on employment-based green cards in order to give more equal chance of permanent residency to qualified individuals of all nationalities. Representative Chaffetz, who maintains an active presence on Twitter and tweets from at Jason in the House, is married with three children, his wife's here today. As a freshman congressman, he appeared on the Colbert Report's Better Know a District feature, where he played rock band with Stephen Colbert, and I believe lost a leg wrestling match to him. Please, yeah, please, yeah, 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 yeah. please join me in welcoming Representative Jason Chaffetz. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. I do appreciate it. I'm here with my wife, Julie, who's now standing right there, uh, and, uh, and Troy Stock, who's a counsel for us in, in the office. He's a Duke grad, uh, but other than that, he's an all-around good guy. Um, and I do appreciate being here. It's always great to be in a place where open collar is acceptable. This is what we should all aspire to. Uh, I was actually born in Los Gatos. I uh, lived in Saratoga until I was like eight years old. And too bad Dad didn't keep that property because uh, it, it was those cow fields out by uh, the Palmasan Vineyards over there. Now some nice multi-million dollar homes. But uh, I have great fond memories uh, growing up uh, in this area and some, some good friends uh, along the way. So. Um, it's an honor and privilege to serve in the United States Congress, but I got to tell you, it's a mess. Uh, in many ways, it's an absolute disaster out there. And uh, normally, when I get up, I talk about the massive accumulation of debt and all that. But for another day, we're gonna we're gonna focus on some things that I have great, uh, I have keen interest in, um, and that obviously you do as well. And so I'd like to just focus on, on technology. And uh, really kind of hit four, probably five areas really quick. And then I just, whatever question, I mean, question and answers you, you have, I, I would love to get your, your feedback. Um, you got to recognize that in the House of Representatives, I'm probably by far at the bottom sort of 10% in the age range. Uh, not to say that uh, older generations can't learn technology, but they didn't really grow up with the technology to the degree that maybe younger generations did. And, um, and one of my favorite stories is about the, uh, the member of Congress and who, uh, this happened about a year and a half ago, I've only been in Congress just over three years, but a year and a half ago, their office was excited because they got a BlackBerry. They just kind of hadn't quite grasped the whole concept of how the BlackBerry might improve uh, uh, the efficiency, effectiveness in the office. That, uh, the idea was that if you went out and you wanted to check it out, you could check it out for a moment, and then when you came back, you could check it back in. That's their idea of technology. And, uh, but that's what we're up against, because we have too many people who, who don't necessarily use technology, understand technology, and yet 
it's moving at such a rapid pace, it, it prevent, uh, presents a whole number of challenges out there. Um, it, and you mentioned this, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, you know, when SOPA was coming along, I love the people that name bills in Washington, D.C., you know, stop online privacy. I, of course, everybody's in favor of that. Uh, but what they didn't understand is how it worked, and that was the call that we had. I said, if you don't know, understand what DNSSEC is, you can't vote for this bill. You're going to perform surgery on the Internet, and you don't have a doctor in the room. Let's bring in some nerds, have a hearing, actually have a discussion, and then maybe you can you can think about voting for this bill. But I think once you understand what you're doing and trying to replumb, uh, you're going to try to, to reroute how the, the Internet works, you're actually going to harm cybersecurity. You're not going to improve it. You're actually going to harm these things, not improve it. And I think that ultimately at the, was one of the one of the winning messages that happened there. It, it, it scared people to, yeah, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. And uh, certainly, uh, this community, which has not been as politically active as other sectors, uh, suddenly got politically active and flexed some muscle. And uh, it scared a lot of members. Um, I'd like to say that it, a lot of members responded to their constituents. They heard them loud and clear. And, and that's good. I think tech as a sector needs to flex more of its muscle. It does need to get masses of people involved and engaged in the public process because so many of the issues that are before us are, are, are difficult ones. If they were easy to solve, they would have been solved a long time ago. Um, now, one of the areas that I'm keen on addressing has to do with, with geolocation. Um, I believe that Americans have, the, have a reasonable right and expectation of privacy. That as Americans, uh, we value our freedoms, we value our liberties. Now, at the same time, our country is often under attack. You look at 9-11, another potential terrorist attack. It's very real. We have to find that balance. And I think the challenge for the American people is to not overstep that bound. Let's not give up every personal liberty and freedom in the name of security. Uh, everybody wants to be safe. But again, I don't, does, don't think that that means that you should necessarily be tracked at every step of the way. So I joined with Senator White, bicameral, bipartisan ways, a very liberal Democratic senator, uh, and uh, I'm about as conservative as they get. I come from Utah. Remember, in Utah, it's the only state where Bill Clinton came in third. So you know we're pretty conservative out there in Utah, but we, we, we have joined forces to, to introduce this geolocation bill, which basically requires that uh, law enforcement would have to get a warrant in order to track somebody it was, I think, supported by the Jones case, which law enforcement had put a GPS device on a vehicle, followed it for 28 days, person committed a crime, it went to court, defense argued that that was an unreasonable search, and uh, Supreme Court agreed in nine to nothing. What was important to me in that case, though, was Justice Alito in what he said, and Justice Alito, and by the way, I'm not an attorney, Usually that's an applause line, but maybe not. <laughs> maybe not here, okay? But, uh, yeah, in fact, it was funny. I was meeting with Speaker Boehner, and we were talking about committee assignments, and the Speaker said, well, what about judiciary? And I said, well, I'm not an attorney. And he said, exactly. That's why I want you on the judiciary committee. So give a little perspective outside the world of attorneys. But Justice Alito said in, in the opinion on the Jones case that Congress was really going to need to address the balance that is needed between personal privacy and law enforcement. But it's not just about law enforcement. We also need to, I think, put some protections and bounds on somebody else following you surreptitiously. Yet, at the same time, allow somebody to give permission to a company or a service, or you know, whether it be Facebook or whatever, Google or whatever it might be, uh, you know, an untold number of other companies, that give, you give permission to them to give you information about where you are, what products, what services you might like. We want to be able to maintain that relationship. But as the example I use, we don't want some spurned lover to be able to follow and track somebody and say, oh, she's not at home right now. Um, that those types of things, I think, need some sort of balance. And right now, it's not against federal law for you to. If I had somebody in Kansas City that I wanted to follow, I could go ahead and do that. Uh, if I knew technologically how to get from here to there. So, that's why this geolocation bill, I think, is, is important. Law enforcement is also certainly, well, you know, we could, their argument is, we could have a law enforcement officer follow you if we have some suspicion. And so this just leverages us. Well, 
under that theory, there is no there is no bound by which, well, if I could follow this gentleman, I could follow that gentleman, well, why not follow everybody? Then we'd all be more safe, right? Um, anyway, we put some limitations on that. The other thing that we've uh, spent some time on, I took a very tough stance on immigration. Uh, I, I, and I won't go through all of it, but to tell you that the heart of what I argued in immigration is that what is the current status quo in this country is very immoral. I think we're exploiting people. And what we have a duty to do in Congress is to fix legal immigration. We have to fix legal immigration. So that's why, in my promise to the voters of Utah, I wanted to help fix that. And that's where we introduced this uh, Fairness for High-Skilled Immigrants, where it got rid of the per-country cap uh, on uh, uh, business-type visas. Uh, there's an arbitrary cap of 7%. That is, no country could get more than 7% of any one uh, visa category. Well, the problem with that is we never took into account proximity. We never took into account the size of countries. Certainly India or China maybe probably shouldn't get the same uh, number of visas as maybe Zambia. Um, and what we heard routinely from companies, employers, was we just want the best talent. I don't care where they come from. We're kind of agnostic to this whole. We're, 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 we want to be blind. We just want the very best person to help us grow this American company. And that seems to make, that makes a lot of sense to me. So there's no net increase or decrease in the total number of visas, but it says you don't have to tap out at getting people out of the Philippines and then have to go somewhere else. You can continue to hire the very best person. The other thing I did on the family side, just as a side note, is uh, again, per country caps at 7%. Well, Mexico has great proximity. We have a lot of people from Mexico that have immigrated legally, lawfully to the United States. They probably have relatives and people that want to work here too. So we moved that arbitrary 7% cap up to 15%. More than double. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. We voted in the, in the House, in the Judiciary Committee. It passed out easily. Uh, went to the floor of the House. There were only, I think it was 14 members of the House of Representatives out of 435 that voted against it. It's over at the Senate. It's now sitting with on Senator Grassley's desk. He put a hold on it. I don't know exactly why, but um, it's over there. And, and nevertheless, we will continue to pursue that. Uh, one other uh, one that I want to mention quick, quickly that is very important to uh, the country and certainly this uh, to this uh, Bay Area is repatriation. Uh, we have literally tens, if not hundreds, of billions of dollars sitting overseas. Uh, given the tax code and tax scheme, uh, it's very difficult to bring that money back to the United States. If that infusion of money could come back to the United States, I think you'd see it invested in the United States, used to grow jobs in the economy. And um, it's something I'm very supportive of. I won't dwell on it, but I think it is very important in terms of tax policy to incentivize capital to come back to, to, to the United States. And let me just kind of summer in, in in closing here, before we do the question and answer, I really do think one of our great challenges, and I need your help, and we want to get your, your feedback. There is no easy answer here. But I think one of the great challenges we have are these bounds of privacy. Um, how do we define that? Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, this morning on Drudge, for instance, or right at the top, dealing with drones and airspace. Uh, that's not an easy answer. Um, should you, in the privacy of your home, whether you've got a big, huge, you know, a state or you have an apartment or whatever, um, should somebody be able to hover over your home and look down into your property? Um, used to be that from a fixed location, okay, that's pretty well defined. People would put up fences and other things. I think there was an understanding that law enforcement would throw a helicopter up to, you know, on a Friday night, there's some gang activity, they'd have a helicopter up there. Uh, but drones, are we going to move to uh, pervasiveness, where drones are omnipresent. Should they be armed? That was one of the discussions today in, in the news. Um, that's a difficult question. Uh, in my state of Utah, the drug DEA, uh, we have a, if you're going to drive from Los Angeles to Chicago, one of the key ways you do is go through Vegas, up I-15 and across on I-70. The Drug Enforcement Agency is saying that they're, perhaps they're going to take um, license plate readers. I don't know if you've seen these, but law enforcement can drive down the road, they're license plate readers, and then they go and they literally read thousands and thousands of plates. Oh, there's a stolen one. Then they can deal with it. Their thought is, well, if we do it mobily, why not put up a permanent one? 
Well, you can see where fairly quickly you're going to see where, where does that end? Well, let's just have it every street corner. Let's just monitor everybody at every street corner. That, that way we can find every bad guy. These are, these are questions and problems and challenges that I think we have to, have to come to grips with, and there are no easy answers. So, um, but something I think is, is imperative, and it will be a good national dialogue, and, and I'd appreciate your, your input, because technology is moving so swiftly, which is great, but at the same time, uh, we need to have a, a moral and ethical uh, discussion about what is right, what is wrong. Everybody wants to catch bad guys, but we also want to have the freedom and liberty to be Americans and travel be who we are, where we want to be, and we decide whether or not, where people can follow us, what they will learn about us, and, and that's, our, that's our collective challenge. Anyway, thanks for having me here, and uh, please, let's fire away some questions, anybody. Patriot Act, um, there is an exclusion under that that excludes, separates out. There's, so there are exceptions for law enforcement on the geolocation. One of them is, has to do with FISA and the Patriot Act. Um, the other one has to do with the immediacy of somebody's uh, re a reasonable, I can't remember, the council will help me here with how we worded this, but a reasonable expectation of bodily harm, you know, a child endangerment, somebody's. Um, and, and that was one of the, we had a hearing, and one of the things that was brought up is, how do you define that? If a friend says you might be in trouble, does that then give law enforcement the opportunity to, to go and do some triangulation and figure out where your phone is? I think there are some reasonable ways to say, look, uh, we don't know where grandma is, and she has all the numbers, and you know, there should be a way to be able to do that. What I'm ultimately concerned about is this general surfing up, well, let's just tackle, let's just do everybody. And, um, but there are some, I voted, by the way, I was the only member on the House, on the Republican side of the aisle in the House Judiciary to vote against the Patriot Act. Um, I do think it goes a bit far in certain areas. I will tell you, though, that CISPA, which I don't know if you've uh, looked at CISPA, but uh, this was an intelligence bill with the, the Congressman Mike Rogers, I did vote in favor of that. This is a voluntary program that basically allows um, private entities to share information with the um, federal government, and the federal government can then voluntarily share information with private companies. Um, our intelligence agencies, for instance, like the NSA and others, are routinely gathering, which is what we want them to do, right? They're gathering information about perhaps what's happening in Russia. Well, if we knew there was a cyber attack coming, coming wouldn't we want that information then to be given to the McAfee's of the world to, to help protect our internet? Of course we would. But there hasn't been a legal mechanism in order to do that in the past. And so I think there was some thought, at least originally, that perhaps is CISPA like SOPA? No, it's totally not like that. Particularly given the voluntary nature where technology companies or anybody really you know, who's using technology can voluntarily share, look, I've been under attack. This is where it's coming from. And limit some of the liability and then being able to share that with others so they too don't become under attack. There's some famous cases out there where it overstepped the bounds. So it's kind of a long-winded answer to your short, short question, but yeah, there is a carve out on the fun stuff. Great. Uh, Craig Montori, I do uh, start visa work. Um, so for your bill, so Senator Grassley has gone from a 41-page amendment down to just asking for the Irish visas to be removed from Senators uh, Schumer and Brown. So uh, the question is, how, how can we help you and the House put more pressure on Senator Grassley to allow a vote on the bill. He can still vote no, but just let a vote happen. Let me explain that, the process, because you're, you're in on to something. They have what's called a hotline in the Senate. Uh, in the House, we call it um, a suspension bill. That is, you take what are generally considered non-controversial bills, and they're very swiftly brought to the floor. They have a higher threshold of passage. You have to get two-thirds of the vote in order to pass it. Um, and so rather than coming under an open rule with all these amendments and everything, it just comes under suspension of the rules. It's routinely done. That's in large part how we pass bills in the House, a lot of numerous bills, you know, non-controversial stuff. 
in the Senate, they have a, a hotline, and that is, hey, we have this bill coming up. If anybody has an objection, you've got two hours or whatever the time period is to voice an objection. Otherwise, we're going to voice vote it on the floor of the Senate. Senator Grassley did what we call it, put a hold on it. He raised his hand and said, uh, I've got a problem with this bill. Usually a mechanism for him to kind of try to negotiate something out. So you're right, it went from this very lengthy, you know, fix of bigger, broader immigration uh, down to perhaps something, to, if, if it was, as you described, it's, it, uh, so much of this gets involved in election year, but um, there are certain um, immigration status uh, opportunities based on country. And so the thought was to try to allow more Irish visas, much like they do in Australia. That's what he was trying to play for. And so Scott Brown got involved. I mean, there were a lot of other moving parts to this. It, the deal never really kind of came together. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it is that Senator Grassley is doing to, to keep or put a hold on this. Um, you know, I, I respect his right to do that. but. We need the Senate to actually do something. We need to get rid of those Wednesday night bingo and wheelchair races and actually do something in the United States Senate. I can tell you this, it's sweeping generality. I cannot figure out what those people do all day. But a little frustrating. Uh, more egregious. 
Um, what do you think about that view, and how, if at all, does it apply to some of the technology measures we're talking about? Yeah, I, I, look, I think this is a challenge, not just Republican or Democrat. I think it's a challenge of principle. As you look at public uh, people that are elected to public office, one of the keys you ought to look at is how do they stand on principle or do they just stand for their party? And and uh, you know I can think of examples where I really challenged my own party. I remember, and I think that's what you want. That's what I aspire to. That's what you want. People take public office. Are they doing it on principle or are they doing it for their party? And and that's that's the collective. Um, and so I can point to things in Bush administration. I can point to things in the Obama administration. I can point. It goes both ways. It's more about electing and getting the right individuals in there and then calling them out on it. And I think you gain more credibility when you call out your own party and your own president and your when they step over the line. And uh, I remember when Nancy Pelosi, the the, uh, the RNC the Republican National Committee, came out with an ad. It was uh, comparing Nancy Pelosi to one of the. Sorry, I don't want to necessarily repeat it here, but you know, one of these uh, uh, 006, one of these James Bond characters, you know, and I was very vocal in saying that is so absolutely wrong. And uh, so I don't know. I'm not here to pick on the president. I'd like to say that, I, I, but I will argue with him on issues. I think he's done some things very well, but I think for the most part he he uh, he's done things wrong, and I think he's in over his head. And I, I if I would be left up to me, I'd fire him. But uh, that's from a purely objective point of view. <laughs> I, I hope that answers it. I hope that answers it. It goes both ways. Yeah, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, I don't know if we... No, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. it's okay. We, uh, I did see you. We'll come back next. We'll come back. I can, I can defer to... Oh, no, we're committed now, oh, so we'll, we'll come back here after. <laughs> This is like if you're not looking behind me. Uh, Declan McCullough from CNET. Uh, there's, I wanted to go back to uh, to CISPA for a moment, and uh, I know you weren't a sponsor and you explained your, your thinking, uh, but I, I didn't want to go into the merits of it, just, just the, the partisanship of it. Uh, it seems like uh, after the, the White House threatened a veto, uh, this uh, became much more uh, of a partisan issue during the House floor vote. Did, how much uh, did that affect your vote on it? Uh, the Republicans kind of lined up uh, for it, and the Democrats kind of lined up against it. Was, was, was that the dynamic, or what, what, what led to the ultimate CISPA vote? No, the CISPA vote, I, I like the, the, the White House is something, it always bothers me. I, I once introduced the bill in the White House, um, said they were going to veto it within 30 minutes. I hadn't even filed the bill. So don't tell me you've even read it. You know, I, I have a hard time with that. Um, I, I leaned more on this valley and uh, you know people and organizations that I respected. A lot of good trade associations, organizations out there. Tech has gotten much more organized, I mean literally in the last uh, 12 months. Um, and so I you know, leaned on uh, friends and people that I respect in terms of understanding and having to live with the consequences. That's why I ultimately supported it. There were some amendments that uh, Chairman Rogers accepted that I think were pivotal to ultimately passing that. But my challenge back to the president and to the Democrats was, okay, well, if you don't want to do this, what, then what do you want to do? Because you can't just ignore cybersecurity. You can't just ignore. We are under constant attack. And it's everything from nation states to a guy in a van down by the river. And, um, but we have to be careful on those bounds. I mean, we really do. And we take freedom of speech in this country very seriously. The First Amendment is pivotal. Um, but this was not that. This, particularly when it became voluntary, that's when I think it turned the corner and ultimately uh, earned the respect of a, of a lot of people. And again, the challenge to the Senate is, okay, if you don't want to do this, then what do you want to do? And is it really going to make a difference? And uh, they don't seem to have many answers to that. Yes, I'm sorry. So apologies, Tim. Yes, yes, my, my fault, my fault. Um, my name is Emily Lamb. I work for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, which is a public policy trade association for 75 companies in the area. And we want to thank you for your work on SOPA, uh, on immigration reform and repatriation, all of which we agree with uh, your position on. Um, we were in D.C. last month, and my sense actually from previous trips is that uh, I hear the possibility of the hints of bipartisanship um, from both sides, uh, which gives me some hope. Uh, is this unfounded, or do you think that there actually could be some movement this year on, on a number of um, I, look, I hope so. I, I, like, I, 
I come as, from as conservative a district as it can possibly be. I won my last election by about just under 50 per percentage points. I mean, I, I, you know, but I think it's a feather in everybody's cap to work on a bipartisan way. You know, not to get off topic, but my criticism in part of the Obama administration is when they passed out so-called Obamacare, they didn't bring a single Republican with them. Now, is that the Republicans' fault, or is that sort of the Democrats' fault? I, th I, I blame leadership there. They had the House and Senate and the presidency. It was easy to, wasn't easy, but they could go get all of their votes. But could they do it in a bipartisan way? And I look at the bills that I've been able to pass out um, that I do think have legs, um, and we did so in a bipartisan way. Like on SOPA, myself and Daryl Issa on the Republican side of the aisle, and then Zoe Lofgren and Jared Polis over on the Democratic side. Now, I could not be more polar opposite in terms of my politics than Jared Polis. But I do probably more stuff with Jared than just about anybody, certainly on the Republican side of the aisle. Um, that's why it was important when I was working on the, um, uh, on the, cyber, on the, the uh, geolocation bill. Purposely, I thought, you know what, I have, we have to have a Democrat here. Just so happens that Wyden had actually been working on this too. It's like we were both working on it, and then we finally found each other and kind of came together, and it just makes it that much more strong. Fairness for high school uh, immigrants, same thing. Again, Zoe Lofgren, uh, Jared Polis, both on House Judiciary, they were superstars on this. And without their support, we'd probably be struggling and languishing, maybe not even have passed. So. I hope so. I hope so. I but fight for principle. But no one per the way our founders and our constitution was set up. No one person is supposed to get everything they want. I everybody's got to recognize that. What I think is intolerable. What I think is inexcusable. And part of my I get I get whipped up on the president on this one is when he stands before the American people and says, "Well, Congress won't do anything. We're going to do it ourselves. We'll just go it alone." That's not leadership. That's not what this country's about. That's not what the presidency's all about. You're supposed to have to work hard. You're supposed to have to engage people on both sides of the aisle. That's why you have a House, a Senate, and a presidency. And um, anyway, I could keep going on President Obama, but um, but that I, I think there is an opportunity. This bill on immigration does not solve all of our problems, but it's a starting point. And as Troy and I were talking about, we can accomplish this small step that could potentially, okay, we've taken one step, now let's, 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 let's take that model, let's do that again, let's take another step. I think the idea in the near future of passing an all-encompassing immigration bill, to too many people it's been code for amnesty, and that scared a lot of people off. Let's tackle it one issue at a time. Can we, we can do that. Let's not try to do it all at once, just one at a time. But this bill, I think, is that first step, and why it's imperative that we actually pass it in the president's sign. Yeah. Hi, this is Michelle Quinn with Politico. And just a follow-up on that question, and this is something I've been talking to you about. There are a whole bunch of other immigration bills. Some took your idea verbatim, um, and thinking of uh, Senator Brand and Senator Warner has a new bill. Senator Coons and Senator Rubio uh, joined them. And I just was wondering if you had a sense of, if you've had a chance to look at it, it doesn't, it goes beyond what your bill said, but it, 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 it includes your provisions for beta, as far as I can tell. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that as a compliment. I, I think, what, so, Troy, you can jump in here too. I think one of the most collaborative I've seen, at least on both sides of the aisle, has been, um, uh, Marco Rubio. I think he genuinely wants to get in the, his fingernails dirty and, and help solve this problem. Um, he's been very good working with his, his staff as much as anybody. I can tell you, uh, Luis Gutierrez, who's uh, a Democrat, I think he's the, I don't, pardon me, i got to get his title right, but I think he's the chairman of the, is he a chairman of the Hispanic Caucus or something like that? Uh, out of Illinois, uh, he and I work together great. We don't agree on everything, but we agree on a lot of things. Um, probably scares both of us. Um, but um, hey, I, like, I have no pride of ownership. If there's a different way to get it passed, let's just get it passed and move on. So. we got to be able to do it. So. Hi, Joyce Butler, BNA. 
question, that how do you harmonize the uh, needs of individual desire for privacy with businesses' desire to track? Specifically, I'm thinking of mobile applications and some of the benefits. How do you balance those tensions and provide a sense of you know, privacy while still providing value without being too micromanaging? Um, as somebody who holds a federal office, I don't think I should be the one to make that decision. <coughs> Um, I want individuals to be able to make that decision, and if they give permission to a company, um, I just want there to be exposure and knowledge so that they're making an informed decision. Um, and if they change their mind, they can change their mind. Um, what I get worried about is outside of that influence, if, when you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship um, and you decide to participate with somebody, that's your business. Um, what I worry about are all the outside folks who are going to want to tap into that without your knowledge. That's when I start to have a problem. That's where I think law enforcement needs to get a warrant, have some degree of, of cause in order to do that, and where individuals should not just be able to surreptitiously watch or follow you without your knowledge. And right now, technology is it's pretty easy to follow somebody, um, and there are not federal prohibitions uh, to do so. Uh, the Jones case was very pivotal. Uh, I cannot tell you how important it was, uh, particularly that it came back nine to nothing. Um, that sent, I think, a very uh, strong signal that the court uh, felt that this was a, a step, uh, or that it violated the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. And, and that, to me, was very important and very consistent with what we had been working on for a year plus. And if you have ideas and suggestions on how to, how to define this, I'm here asking for that, that answer because I think it's something we're all going to struggle with. And technology's moving so fast. It's great, but we need to help, help put some balance on it. Yes? Can I ask one last question? Sure, uh, sure. Uh, with regard to SISPA, uh, you said you felt comfortable with it, and you voted for it, and passed the House. Now it's arguably over on the Senate side, there may be a conference. Um, you said that you wish that White House had given more um, guidance or feedback on what they wanted. Um, Howard, Howard Schmidt, who's the cybersecurities are, I think, is leaving his office in a matter of days or not weeks um, and riding his Harley Davidson to the West Coast. Um, do you feel that that's the right time for him to have left that job when his bill is still, still working his way to Congress? And if you had to make any tweaks to uh, CISPO on the Senate side, what would they be? Uh, look, any individual, uh, everything is bigger than probably any one individual. If it was the right time in his life to move on, you know, that's just. It's personal business, and I, I won't criticize it for that. Um, <coughs> it's been very difficult for the federal government to attract and retain competent talent. Um, we were working, what was his first name, Kundrick? Uh, yeah, Kundrick. Yeah, he, he was awesome. I, I love that guy. Uh, he was the CIO, I think, over there at the White House. Really, really enjoyed his, his friendship and his perspective and his energy. Uh, but then he left. And so ugh, it was frustrating because it felt like we were making some progress. Um, uh, so that's difficult. I like CIS, CISPO the way it is. I think it's a good start. I think we need to reevaluate it every you know, four to six months, see how it's working and how it's not working. Um, but I'm convinced, having seen an awful lot of classified intelligence, the need is definitely there. The need is absolutely there. I do think Americans are right to question their government to make sure and demand that they're not overstepping the bounds, that they're not reading their personal emails and storing those in some secret facility. Um, unfortunately, the FBI and others have overstepped those bounds in the past. I think that's a legitimate question. And there ought to be some um, internal but third-party verification as to what's being uh, stored and what's being peeked at. Um, I, I think those are legitimate questions. Um, but I, I don't have necessarily any alterations or changes to it other than let's get going because we're losing a lot of intellectual property, we're, we're harming a lot of people, um, things are being tapped into that shouldn't be tapped into. we we got a long ways to go to catch up. And by, as soon as we catch up, we'll probably be behind again. So. Listen, y'all y'all are very kind. Thanks for what you do. Thank, you know, we look at the economy, we talk about jobs. This is some, tech is something that is actually working in this country. This is a competitive advantage for the United States of America. And we are the greatest country on the face of the planet. I really do believe that. 
But we got to make sure that we maintain that, that innovative nature. We allow entrepreneurs to thrive. We provide the products and services that our people are looking for around the globe. Uh, this is a growth industry, and um, I want to make sure Washington, D.C. doesn't get in the way and mess it all up for you. So thanks for having me. I, I do appreciate it. Thank you.